Hey everybody, welcome back to The Gavin's Coffee. I'm David, and today we're talking about roasting Indonesian coffee with the handy dandy SR800 from Fresh Roast. But before we get into that, we'll briefly talk about why coffee from Indonesia is unique, as well as discuss the key things to understand when roasting these coffees. But if you'd like to skip straight to the sample roast, there'll be timestamps in the description and along the play progress bar. Also, don't forget to check out our other guides for the SR800 for more tips and tricks. We'll leave a link to that playlist in the description below. Now, just before we dive in today, if you'd like to support us in making helpful guides like this one, you can pick up green coffee, roasted coffee, roasters, brewers, all kinds of coffee stuff at our shop, thecaptainscoffee.com. And don't forget to like this video. It's a free way to support us, and we really do appreciate it. Now, let's get into it. So, let's start with a bit of history. Even if you don't know anything about Indonesian coffee, you know one word, Java. That's because Java is one of the Indonesian islands and is where coffee was introduced to the region by the Dutch over 400 years ago by the Dutch East India Company. Now, we don't have a lot of time for a full-blown history lesson in this video because, to be fair, the history of coffee and colonialism in Indonesia would easily be an entire series of videos. But the short version is that Java's climate, along with its super fertile volcanic soil and high elevation, make an ideal growing environment for coffee. After such a successful start in Java, coffee quickly spread to the neighboring islands of Sumatra, Sulawesi, Bali, and Flores, all places where it's still grown and produced today. So the next thing we need to talk about is processing the coffee, because it's probably the biggest factor in making Indonesian coffee so unique. Most of the coffee in Indonesia is processed using a traditional technique called giling basa, which I'm probably mispronouncing, but it directly translates to wet grind and what we commonly refer to as wet hulling. Wet hulling is a semi-wash processing method that combines aspects of fully washed and natural processed coffee. It's probably closest to fully washed. And as a quick reminder, with fully washed coffee, the fruit of the coffee cherry is completely removed and washed off of the beans before they're allowed to dry. Well, actually, not all the outer fruit is removed right away. At this point, there's actually a thin protective layer still left on the coffee called parchment. Once the coffee dries to around 10 to 12% moisture content, the dried parchment comes off really easily, and now we've got fully processed green beans. With wet hulling, all the steps in wash processing stay the same until we get to the parchment stage. Instead of waiting for the coffee to dry to 10 to 12% moisture before removing the parchment, wet hulled coffee begins removal at around 30 to 50% remaining moisture, thus the name wet hulled. After parchment removal, the coffee is left to dry one final time until it reaches 10 to 12% moisture, just like with fully washing. As a quick note here, Lots of growers in Indonesia produce remarkable fully washed and natural processed coffees as well. Just keep in mind that unless the coffee you're buying specifies a different processing method, it's almost certainly wet hold. So what does wet hold Indonesian coffee taste like? Well, it's got a really distinctive flavor profile. It's got much lower acidity and much more body than fully washed coffee. Now bear in mind, when coffee nerds talk about acidity, we don't mean pH level, like vinegar. We mean something I describe as brightness, or even a sparkling quality. Think lemon zest. However, some folks just aren't into that, and Indonesian coffee is perfect for them. As far as body and texture goes, think syrupy. I mean, thick. Just body for days. Mm. Now let's talk about some considerations when we're roasting our wet hold Indonesian coffee. First is our desired roast level. Indonesians are extremely heavy and dense due to their growing environment. That makes them perfect for roasting in the medium to dark range. They're one of the few coffees we consistently recommend to folks who prefer darker roasts since their robust flavor profile still shines through even in darker roasts. That being said, if you want to accent what little acidity there tends to be, stay closer to medium. Also, darker roasts will be a little bit thinner. 
That's why our recommended roast level is right in the full city plus to Vienna range, or just between medium and dark. Be careful though. If you're watching the beans for oil to know if they're getting into this range, Indonesian beans can be deceptive. It's not unusual for it to take days for the oil to become obvious on the outside of the beans, so pay attention to the cracks rather than the appearance while roasting. For this roast level, we want to hear a solid, consistent second crack, and after a day or two, we should see little spots of oil, although not completely covering the bean with oil. Here's where it's important to also consider our total roast time. As usual, our total roast time is set by our target roast level. For a medium to dark roast, we're going to target six and a half to seven and a half minutes for first crack. That means if we do what we need to, we'll hit second crack around three minutes after that, and we'll add in 30 or so more seconds of a consistent second crack, and our target total roast time will be 10 to 11 minutes. You can roast a tad slower or faster and still be in an acceptable range, but I'd recommend avoiding roasts longer than 12 minutes and shorter than nine, or you risk baking your beans or underdeveloping them. Now, as I mentioned, Indonesian coffees are super hard and dense. This means we have a lot of headroom for heat adjustment and experimentation, since it's really hard to add too much heat to them. We're going to end up pushing heat pretty heavily during the roast in order to get the beans up to those darker roast levels without baking them. Thankfully, Indonesian beans can take the heat. This also means Indo coffee is great for beginners, as it's very forgiving to roasters who are nervous about making adjustments during the roast and overcorrecting. When in doubt, once the beans get moving consistently under a nominal fan setting, crank the power to max and your coffee should be just fine. Also, wet hold coffee doesn't really make much chaff, so if you don't see much after you're roasting, don't worry, you didn't do anything wrong, it's perfectly normal. Because of this though, wet hold coffee also does great with an extension tube, so if you've got one, go wild. Finally, just some basic reminders on best practices when using the SR800 or any home roaster. Make sure you're using a power outlet that's on a dedicated 20 amp or higher circuit, and when possible, avoid using an extension cord. Check your ambient temperature to ensure it's above about 60 degrees in colder weather. During these hot summer months, if you roast outside at really high ambient temperatures, say over 90 degrees, your roaster's air temp will also be hotter, so remember to start with lower temperature settings. Finally, if you're roasting inside, turn on your oven's exhaust fan or roast near open windows. So now that we're familiar with the basics of Indonesian coffee and important considerations when roasting it, it's time to share a sample roast. Keep in mind, following this roast exactly isn't guaranteed to be a perfect roast for you and your coffee. But it's a great starting point that you can use to gauge adjustments in order to help you get the roast you're looking for. For best results, always keep a roast log, noting your adjustments during the roast, and keep notes of which roast tastes the best. Because at the end of the day, all that matters is that you like your coffee. Today we're roasting an Indonesian classic, Sumatra Mandaling. We're going to start off with the fan set all the way up at 9 because the beans are really heavy and hard to get moving at room temperature. And we'll start our heat out fairly low at 4 to prevent the beans in the bottom from getting scorched until they start really moving. After about a minute, the beans are up and moving, so we can reduce our fan down to eight. I'm gonna go ahead and bump up our power as well to get these dense beans jump started. As I've mentioned before, it's really not necessary to have all the beans flying all over the place to get a nice even roast. They just need to be circulating well within the chamber, as you can see here. At about two and a half minutes, the beans are once again moving nicely, and it's time to add another dose of heat by dropping our fan to seven and increasing the power to six. As we can tell by this pale yellow color to the beans, we're approaching the end of the drying phase, which happens when they reach around 320 degrees Fahrenheit. 
So I'm keeping the air temperature well ahead of that in order to be sure we don't stall these dense beans on the way to first and eventually second crack. As we approach four minutes, we're well into the Maillard or caramelization phase of the roast as it leads up into first crack, which occurs when the beans reach about 380 degrees Fahrenheit. If we were roasting less dense or natural processed beans, I'd let them gently work through this phase, but our Indonesian beans soak up lots of heat and I notice our air temperature is stalling. The beans aren't moving enough to decrease the fan for additional heat, so instead I'm going to increase the power to keep the heat in the chamber rising. As we head to the 5 minute mark, I notice my temperature stalling out yet again, and I want to keep pouring it on so we have plenty of thermal momentum post first crack. As you can see, I try to decrease the fan for that heat, but these super heavy beans still aren't ready for that. So instead, I'm just going to increase the power once more. We're coming up on six minutes and we're just seconds away from first crack. And once again, my air temperature is stalled, which would be fine if we were stopping the roast in the city plus to full city range, but I'm pushing for a darker roast. That means it's time to make a big push of heat by dropping the fan to six. Now still the beams aren't moving all that much, but I can see them gently circulating in the chamber, so I'm not too concerned. At exactly six and a half minutes, I get the very first snap of first crack. Now I can tell these beans need a little more motivation to break into a full first crack, so I'm gonna up the power one last time to nine. Sure enough, we've got a nice first crack. Here at eight minutes, the beans are light enough again for another dose of heat. So I'm gonna drop the fan to five, and since I know that that'll be plenty of heat for now, I'm gonna pull the power back down to eight. I know that second crack will occur when the beans reach around 420 to 430 degrees Fahrenheit, so I wanna keep the air temperature well ahead of that. So here we are at nine minutes and it's time for one more big push of heat. And the beans are once again moving nicely, so I'll just drop the fan to four. So just shy of 10 minutes and second crack has finally begun. Now at this point, the beans have plenty of thermal momentum all on their own. So I don't need to keep pouring heat into the chamber while they spend some time in second crack. So I'm reducing the power all the way down to five. And after about 30 seconds of second crack, I'm ready to call the roast done. I'm gonna put the roaster into cool mode and I'll fast forward through most of the cooling phase, but note that I continually increase the fan during cool to keep the beans cooling off as quickly as possible. One final tip here as we're on the last 30 seconds of the cooling cycle. A trick I've found to keep chaff from falling back into the roasting chamber when the cycle finishes is to drop the fan to four or five and remove the chaff collector for the last few seconds of the cycle. Be really careful and wear gloves or oven mitts, unlike me, because 
it's still pretty hot. Vacuum what little chaff flies out with a shop vac, and there we have it. Our medium to dark roasted Indonesian beans are done. There you have it, our guide to roasting Indonesian coffee with the SR800. I really hope you found this video helpful and I hope you learned something new. If you did, leave us a like down below, subscribe for more coffee roasting and brewing guides. If you have more questions about roasting Indonesian or wet hold coffees, just leave us a comment down below. We really do read all our comments and try to respond to them quickly. And feel free to share your tips and tricks down there as well. So that's all we have today, friends. Thanks for watching. Happy roasting.